Chairman, so we have heard over and over at the beginning of every session for as long as I can remember, you and I have both been around the Capitol for a long time, longer than some, not as long as some others, but we've heard at the beginning of every session, this is the session we're going to fix school finance. You say it with confidence, you say it with enthusiasm, and then we get to the end of the session. I, I didn't say it, by the way. You may not say it, <laughs> but you know, the royal we say it. This is the session, and then you get to the end of the session and Lucy pulls the football away from Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown ends up flat on his back. Why should we believe you this time? Well, because it's, it is a different time. Uh, the momentum that I see from all sides, uh, rural, suburban, Democrat, Republican, so we have a lot of momentum and I think we also have a lot of horsepower. You've seen something that's kind of unprecedented here in Texas, as probably many legislative bodies. The House and the Senate, we have a new speaker. Yep. Uh, the lieutenant governor have already met the governor. They've all said their number one issue for this session is school finance. Kumbaya moment. Unbelievable. Right. I mean, it really is. And I really feel like the stars are kind of aligning for something that only happens about every 40 to 50 years. Yeah. Is this an outgrowth of the elections in the sense that when you all were out campaigning, those of you on the ballot campaigning to be reelected this time, you heard from the voters, this is our priority? Or were the results of the election kind of a brushback pitch? where the implication of it was, since the elections were so close, so many people were turned out of office, if you don't fix public education this time, we're coming for you in two years. I, I think there's some to that. Uh, yeah. The brush back, back pitch is probably a pretty good analogy. Uh, but there's also a lot of things that have come together. We, we've also had the School Finance Commission right. that met during the whole interim. That, that commission met for over a year, or right. a, a year, you, January to December. Yes. Uh, a very diverse group of folks. You know, when I, that was one of my bills last session was to develop this public school finance commission to really do a deep dive yeah. into where we are in education, how we're funding. You know, our formulas are some of them are from the 80s, right. 90s, and uh, that deep dive really, first of all, it was a very diverse group. The speaker, the lieutenant governor, the governor did an excellent job of picking the members of that commission. It was a very diverse group. Right. There are politicians. There were school folks, S teachers, superintendents, Democrats, state Republicans, board of education, right? yeah. all across the board, and they literally put aside their differences and went to work for the, the children of Texas. Yeah. Now, you know, some of us smart asses in the press uh, say, well, why are you doing a school finance commission to study your problem you've been studying for essentially 40 years? Why don't you just fix it? And there was some frustration at the end of the last session that you had the opportunity potentially to put money into public ed and ultimately couldn't come to some common purpose and instead went ahead and did this commission. It was worth it in oh, the end. Oh, very much so. And, and frankly, if we would just put more money in last time, we would just put more money in. What we're talking about is doing transformational things for right. education. You know, our, our student body has changed. Yep. And our, frankly, our school finance system has not changed with it. The, the fact that our largest demographic now is low income. Yep. Kids who qualify for free and reduced lunch is now our largest demographic. It's also our fastest growing. Yep. So the state of Texas today is different than the state of Texas when this school finance system was first put together. So if the School Finance Commission uh, report was so important, and there were recommendations in the report. How come when you all came out with your Senate-based budget and you made a proposal on funding public education, you picked something that wasn't in the school finance report, in the well, commission report? Well, the school finance commission report didn't have a big number. It didn't have the numbers to it. Right. And, and, and let me tell you why that is. The strategy behind this, once again, a different way of doing this. Yeah. In the past, any time we've had a discussion about school finance, whether it was a little tweak or a major try to change, yeah. uh, first thing that comes out is the bill and the numbers. Right. The runs. Yeah. And everybody, good legislators all get their highlighters out. They go through and highlight all the districts within their district. And they get kind of freaked out And if it's yes right? or yeah, no, right. if it's good for them, then they'll vote yes or no. Well, that's no way to do public policy for a state right. as big as Texas. Right. So, Frank, what we're trying to do is put together this plan, get some consensus from the, the legislature that this is a good way to do it. This is a fair way to do school finance for the 21st century. And then let's put the numbers to so it. So it was a roadmap for the way forward. And it was kind of an a la carte menu, but without prices. Right. Right. And, and there there's some prices in there, but there's nothing you could add up. Well, there are prices in the appendices. I know one of the conflicts at the end of the process was we need to put a number in there. Well, maybe we shouldn't put a number in there. And in the end, you ultimately did not recommend a specific amount. But if you went back to the appendices and you added up the a la carte menu items, you kind of got to a number. Right. Sort but, of. When it, but when it came time to the Senate based budget to come out again, Mr. Chairman, what you recommended was a pay increase for teachers. I don't recall that being one of the recommendations, at least as stated in the Senate-based budget, from the School Finance Commission report. It, so if the School Finance Commission report was so important, why didn't you recommend things from the School Finance Commission report? Well, it was not in the School Finance Commission report, uh, but the Lieutenant Governor feels strongly, and I think he makes a very good case that our teachers do need a pay raise. 
So I think you'll see some of what the School Finance Commission, which is more of a merit pay type thing, based on the Dallas ISD's ACE program, their Accelerated Campus Excellence, yep. that we learned about during the School Finance Commission. So I think you'll see a combination of those two. But real quick, I'm going to tell you about the Dallas ISD experience. Yeah, this is, Superintendent Hinojosa has gotten a lot of credit, was called out by uh, the governor in the state of the state for his particular plan. Large district. Yeah. Had about 44 districts were in the improvement required category. Uh, they implemented this program called ACE. And what it is is they basically identified their best teachers, yep. their best principals. They paid them significantly more, and they paid them even more if they went to the more challenging campuses. Right. Within one year or two years or so, they went from 44 down to about four. I think it was about three or four years. But one campus in particular, Blanton, really stands out in my mind when we had this discussion. Yep. Blanton had failed four out of the last six years. Their pass rate was about 40%. Within one year of implementing this program, bringing a new principal and, and, and some of the best teachers, they went from 40% passing to 80% passing. Right. Blanton is an 80% plus poverty district. So that's our demographic we need to reach. Pretty extraordinary change in a short period Incredible. of time. Incredible. Within right. two years, right. Blanton Elementary surpassed Highland Park Elementary. Yeah. So this idea that you know, lower income kids can't really achieve because you know, they've got so right. much you know, problems and things to overcome, yeah. that, that may be very much a case of lowered expectations. Right. But Mr. Chairman, the root there, as you've just said yourself, is merit pay, paying for performance. The Senate plan is not a merit pay plan, at least as discussed in the initial stage in the base budget. It is an across the board, everybody gets a raise plan. Well, there's two different bills. Right. Senator Nelson is carrying the pay raise, and I'm still working with Chairman Huberty in the House in drafting the school finance bill. So, you have but, not seen that bill yet. Oh, oh that, that's fair. I want to come back to where the differences between your bill and Huberty's bill will be. But at least as of right now, where the Senate has, has put table stakes out is on a bill that would increase the pay of every teacher. And I think we all understand the process. We all start here, and then we work through the legislative So you're not, you're not confident that in the end, the proposal to pay every teacher additionally, good, bad, and in between... No, I think we'll have some across-the-board pay rates. Some across-the-board yeah. across pay. Let, let me go back to the, to the larger existential uh, theory of the case here, which is the great rebalancing. We have this problem where the state share of public education funding had been close to 50% uh, in 2006. It is now down, I guess, to 37, 38%. Is that right? Here we go. This is that number that's quoted over and over and over again. Real quick, that 37% mm -hmm. is a number that's put out by the Legislative Budget Board. It actually has an asterisk next to okay. it. At the bottom, if you look at it, it says it doesn't include the cost to administer TEA. It doesn't include instructional materials allotment. It doesn't include a whole lot of grants. Do you think that's not a so good that, number? It's not a good number. What it's is not, the real well, number, Mr. Well, Chairman? in fact, what I see, and I see it quoted all the time, the state share of funding public education. Right. What that 37% represents is the state share of funding the foundation school program, yeah. which funds a lot of public education, but it's not the whole picture. So if we do apples to apples, is the number that's typically quoted from 2006 it's close in to 50%, was that also the foundation school program? I, I can't speak to that. I can tell you what it is right now. It's about 40, low 40s. Right. And, so every, and, and, you're the only person I know who, when that number comes up, pushes back. In fact, like Chairman Huberty will say, matter of factly, it's in the mid. We, we fund public education in the mid 30s to the tune of in the mid 30s, down from what it had been. So does the comptroller. It's a perfect example of a numbers repeated enough that people just begin to think. So Huberty and Hager are wrong, and Taylor is right. As well, you far can look at the goes. TEA numbers. TEA has the numbers with all numbers in. Right. And and it's a different number. Do you stipulate without? being able to do apples to apples necessarily, do you stipulate that the state's share of funding, whatever you do to get to the definition of the state's share of funding, do you stipulate that it's down from the mid, to, mid first decade yes. of this? Yes, and that's a product of our current school finance system. Right. And I'm not here to defend the current system because I didn't create it. Right. In fact, no one person or group created the current system that we have. Yeah. It was created, and then we started having lawsuits in the right. 80s and 90s, and it's been adapted and, and changed so it's now not even one committee has done it, which is bad enough to have a committee do anything, but it's a number of committees have all had a hand in it, and it doesn't make sense. It's not connected. There were little fixes which, here, little which, fixes which is there. Which is why we're talking about it, right? Which is why this is an urgent issue. Right. Just like the song I was listening to on the way in by Foreigner, it's urgent. That's what we're walking with. Did you, M Mr. Chairman, did you just drop a Foreigner reference? I did. In this? There was a bet on that, This by is the a way. hip legislature, I gotta say. This is a hip legislature. All right. Um, I've got one more. Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, we, believe me, this is the Texas Tribune. We have nothing but time, so if, go ahead. If we don't change, because here's our demographic. Yeah. I already told you our largest demographic and our fastest growing yeah. is low income. Historically, that's our least educated. 
If we don't change that, we will be in dire straits in the ne very near future. Did you work out this stuff with your staff before you came over here? All on the way driving in. Try to distract, try to distract me, you will not succeed. Um, so again, back to this idea of the great rebalancing. So the theory here is that property taxes are the first input that determine the state share because we see how much we collect for public education on the property tax end of the conversation and then the state puts in the rest. Property tax contribution has gone up over time so the state share has gone down. Right. Whether it's the Huberty number or the Taylor number, however we define the state share, the state share, I'd like to put you guys pitted against one another. You tried that last session. I, and I, look, I, was, I will do it again. <laughs> the, so the state share is lower as a consequence of that side going up. Absolutely. So the, the theory of the case here is the rebalancing. We're going to figure out a way to, to restrain the growth of property taxes. And as a consequence of that, this end of the seesaw will go back up and the state will, will take on a larger share. Well, in fact, what we found out towards the end of the School Finance Commission, which was yep. pretty alarming, is the, the whole recapture, the Robin Hood plan. You know, it's been bumping along about a billion dollars and it's going up to about two. Yep. But as our property values are increasing at the rate they're increasing, the recapture is going up substantially, like right. to about $5 billion right. in five years. Yep and over $10 billion in 10 years. It actually, the way the current system, we stayed on it, recaptures up here and the current state share got, drops to yeah. here, they actually cross. You're not talking about blowing about up- 10 years. You're not talking, Mr. Chairman, about blowing up recapture, right? No, you can't- It's part of this. You can't eliminate completely recapture. Right. It's part of the equity, which, you know, here's the beauty of designing a system today. We now have all these Supreme Court decisions that have been made, so we know the parameters of what our guard, guard bill rails, has to right? fit in. Yeah. We have guardrails. Yeah. When they first created the plan, they didn't have those. Yeah. And that's why they had to modify it. So now, and right. frankly, the Supreme Court also gave us free space to work in. That's the, that decision that was made before last session said our system was constitutional, right. awful, but, but messed lawful. up. Right. Yeah. Awful but lawful, I like that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I get a song out of that, but anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's probably a song in there it's somewhere. It's probably a cheap trick song. But the right. fact is they... As the public ed system has been a cheap trick for so long, right? Yeah. You like that one? I'm not here to defend the current right. system. I'm yeah. trying to change it. Yeah. So cheap trick is probably fine by me. Yeah. Um, but, but we have to adjust that and, 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 and adapt that. So now, but what the Supreme Court said was it's messed up, it's constitutional, but they did a, a very wise thing. And also, frankly, unheard of in modern, in modern times. They said it's not the Supreme Court's job to fix it's it. Your, it's your job. It's the legislature's right. job. So, so, when so that's where yeah. the School Finance Commission came from. Right. You know, we got that decision right before a session, and you've got 140 days. To do what we did on that School Finance Commission is not possible in 140 days. So over 100 hours Are you stipulating testimony. that you can fix this issue or address this issue sufficiently in a regular session without making us all cancel our summer vacation plans? Or should we expect that this is something that's going to extend into How about sessions? everybody else's summer vacation but yours? Uh, no. <laughs> no, seriously, no. can you fix this in a regular session? I, I really think we can. Uh, like I said, the work that the School Finance Commission did, a yeah. very diverse group, if it had been a one-sided plan, yeah. no way. But the fact that this was a diverse group who put aside their differences and found really good... Right consensus items that they know work. Yeah. I think we've got a great opportunity to get this done based on that foundation. So on this question of the rebalancing, will you say that if one side of the seesaw comes down and the other side of the seesaw comes up, that the net effect on public education will not be a wash? Which no. is to say that this is really a property tax reform effort more than a school finance effort. So that property taxes end up coming down in some measure. Again, you can't cut them, but you can restrain the growth. The state share creeps back up from whatever the number is now to something else, the seesaw is balanced more, but that the net in to public education is basically a wash. No. You, that, that, will, that will be failure on, as you view yeah, it if I, that happens. I, I think what you're gonna see, and frankly what the School Finance Commission said, they did recommend additional yeah. funds, but they also recommended reallocating funds that were currently spending. Yeah. To once again adjust to the new dem demographic student body that we have. So stop doing some things within the system as currently funded and move and, that money over and do other things. And to think, well, for, right. for example, compensatory education. That's yeah. what we do for kids who qualify for free and reduced lunch. Right now it's a 1.2. About, about 60% of the system, right? It's a 1.2 yeah. factor. We bump that a little for every student that qualifies, but we've also recognized through the School Finance Commission that density of poverty is an issue. So it's not just, if you have 10% of your student body is low income, that's a different student body than the one that's 80% yeah. low income. So we're actually recognizing that in our recommendations that we increase the compensatory education funding based on the density of poverty yeah. to really help get at where our needs But that's money are. coming from someplace else, whether the current allocation or that's new money. Some of it, some of it's new money. Right. Um, 
So how much? Give me a number. No. Why not? If, if you're saying that you're committing to put, Two, if you're saying that you're three, committing, four. if you're saying that you're committing to money going in over and above the rebalancing, how much, Mr. Chairman? We're working on it. We, uh, Chairman what do you Huber think it's going to be? We're working on it. So 3.7 billion was the initial swing at the ball from the Senate, or was it 4.3? It was about 4 billion, right? There's about a $3 billion difference between what the House suggested initially and the Senate suggested. Um, is your number better than their number? Or is it going to be between the two? Like, give us a sense of where we're going to land here. Take us to the last scene in the movie. I can't do that yet. yet those of you who have not seen the legislative process probably don't like watching sausage being made either, but that's what we have to go through. So you don't really have a number in mind? No. A right number? No. Uh, we're working on that diligently. This yeah. is a very complex bill. If you look at all the, if you want to know what's in the bill, look at the School Finance Commission report. And that's what Chairman Huberty and I are working on. So Chairman on. Huberty, I understand, is going to have a bill in a couple of weeks, soon. Probably the end of February, 1st of March. Will you have a separate bill, or is it going to be, are you waiting to see Huberty's bill? We are working together on the drafting of this bill. Are you going whether to do comes, a borough's Betancourt deal whether, where you're going to come out together with one bill? I'd like for it to come out that way, but it may not. There may be some differences in there because of some of the numbers. But we will have very similar bills that have been worked on together. And we'll know what the differences are when we bring them out. So even if you I would expect yeah. a joint press conference like they did on the other. You would expect a joint mm -hmm. press conference. Okay. Um, okay. Once uh, again, I think we have great momentum behind this effort. The fact that we're doing that says a lot about what's going on. So you, you, you would characterize yourself and Huberty as in alignment yes. as far as the ultimate goals. Yes. Whether the road that you travel is the exact same road, the destination is the same. Transformational school finance system. Right. And, but again, could you define that? Because that's a word that we've heard previous legislatures throw around. And it's One cheap May. to throw that word around in February. What does it ultimately mean in May and beyond that? What does transformational mean? Well, I've given you one example. Uh, the ACE program is transformational. You take that statewide. Now, we're not making schools do it. We're not going to make this a mandatory, you will implement the ACE program. But we're, we're putting that carrot out there. If you'll do it, we'll give you grant money to help get it going. Yeah. Because I, I am absolutely convinced that that program can make a meaningful difference for so many of our students across Texas. Yeah. And I'll guarantee you this, the people of Texas, when they see the benefits of that program, it does cost more. You know, that's one of the problems that Dallas ISD has done. They've implemented this program, and now it's, this costs more money. People of Texas, when they see those kind of benefits from their, their system and a few extra dollars, they'll be willing to pay it to get that kind of educational attainment for those kids. Yeah. So if you won't tell me a number, would you at least stab at what sort of an increase in the state share <clears throat> you are looking at. You know, H Hager, Hager has come out and said he believes that the state share, he's using the mid-30s number, which you don't like. I don't he's like saying it. he thinks that it should go to 40. You know that Ch uh, Chairman Guerin in the, in the House has proposed a constitutional amendment requiring that the state fund 50% of public I education. I, I don't know that. But, uh, but he, he, that's, okay. in fact, that's a true story. He has, in fact, filed that bill and suggested that a constitutional amendment require the state to fund 50% of the share of public ed. And you know how much that would cost? Give me a number. I believe it would cost them, I, I, know, I think I actually know, because I think it's currently 60 billion right now, and that it would cost another 30 billion yeah. to get there. Right, Isn't so you right? think that's gonna happen? Hell no, I don't yeah, think so. Yeah, okay, gonna thank you. But, 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 but <laughs> so, so, if, so don't tell me what you're against, tell me what you're for. What is the percentage that we should be at? We are going to significantly increase what we're doing, and we're gonna balance it out so that the, the recapture slows, so it doesn't have that perilous yeah. uh, incline, like, we're look, like we were looking at right. the end of the school finance. Is there enough commission. money in it, whatever the number ends up being, is there enough money in the budget to do what you want, to do what we need? Well, we have, we're fortunate and blessed, we have a good economy right now. Right. We have good numbers from the, the comptroller. We also have some issues. We have Harvey. Right. Uh, we have school safety that I'm also working on. It's right. not just school, school finance. You underfunded uh, Medicaid last time, so you've yeah. got to come back with a supplemental. That, it's the usual array time. of cans kicked down the road. Yeah. Right. So, that's, yeah. so that's what I'm saying. I can't give you a number right now because we are still working through the process. We'll have a number. I guess I'm asking more existentially if you have confidence in the fact that the budget has enough money in it for you to do the things we need to do. I think it does. You think it does? Mm -hmm. um, what's your disposition on a rainy day fund at the moment? You know, the legislature seems to I love to the rainy day fund. Well, yeah, we all love it. But the legislature has been clutching its pearls over the last couple sessions about this money, and now they've sort of unclutched their pearls a little bit about the possibility well, well, it, of dipping into it. It's growing at a dramatic rate. Right. I mean, we've done well. The oil prices and our oil supply is increasing exponentially. Um, that, that's going to continue to grow, and we have some legitimate 
needs. Rainy day, one, so time, con- one time funding needs con- coming out of Harvey particularly. Har- Har- Harvey is the, is the big one. I think the Chairman Zerwa said to me two weeks ago, he thought $2 billion might have to come out of the Rainy Day Fund just to buy down the Harvey piece of this. Well, like I said, there's a number of other things out there. We're looking at mitigation projects, with, yeah. which require a local match with the Fed, so there may be some Rainy Day Funds right. used for those This is an issue that you know about very Absolutely. well because this is your district, right? Mm-hmm. This is your area of, of, of the state. Um, what about for public education? So there is a question of whether anything that would go to public education, which presumably would be an ongoing expense in almost every instance, well, except would for qualify school. as the one time, maybe retired teacher pensions. School safety. School safety. Yeah, we, have to, we need to retrofit some of these buildings that were built in a different time where we didn't have the concerns we have today. Right. So in some case, we need to go back and make sure those buildings are right. not quite as accessible as they were built to be. Now, I believe the House base budget does call out specifically both retired teacher pensions and school safety as items to be paid for in part through the Rainy Day yeah. Fund. I don't believe the Senate called for those things to be Rainy Day Fund items. I say the, the, the finance, the Senate finance side of the deal was put out before we get here. So I, I, I really didn't have a lot of input in it. You think those things, well, let I'm me on ask the finance you, committee, well, we're working through all that. Well, let me ask you straight away. Do you think that, that school safety should be funded out of the rainy day fund, yes or I, no? Well, there's two different parts of school safety. There's actually more than two parts, but there's ongoing expenses. Right. Safety, school safety officers, uh, resource officers. Mental health counselors. Mental health intervention counselors. Those are ongoing expenses. That's obviously going to have to be a funding stream, but the, the facilities, particularly, you know, bring them up to speed is it, to me, that's a legitimate one-time use range. You'd be for that? Oh, absolutely. What about for retired te- an investment in the retired teacher pension uh, uh, situation? Would you, as on a one-time basis, would you be willing to see rainy day fund money, as the House apparently would, go toward that? If they can make it where it's a one-time deal, I think it's a legitimate use. Uh, right. You know, we obviously have to do that along with some probably some plan changes, so yep. it's not continuing to go the path that it's on. Right. Uh, let me ask you about the property tax piece. So. Before the last legislative session, in Hall- it was Halloween of 2016. Your memory is better than mine. I remember. Well, I remember very specifically it was Halloween because it was me interviewing Lieutenant Governor Patrick before the Greater Houston Partnership, and I know it was Halloween because I threatened to show up in a Joe Strauss mask, actually. <laughs> That's how I remember it was Halloween. Um, he said to me on that day before that group, we're not going to do school finance in the 2017 session unless we do some version of school choice, which ultimately was the plan that the Senate introduced that the House didn't like last session. He said his exact words were, no one without the other. That was the no one without the other in the last session. Is property tax reform the no one without the other in this session? I think you'll have some property tax reductions this session. Well, well. reductions by which you mean the restraint of growth. You are not actually cutting property taxes. Well, actually, the current version we're working on right now has some tax cut. How can you cut a property tax that you don't levy, Mr. Chairman? There's no because, statewide property tax. Because in the current school finance system and the one we're going to have in the future, it's a shared responsibility between the locals and the state. So you actually think that you can engineer it so that property taxes are cut as well, opposed to simply the growth is restrained? I was here one time when we did it before. Yeah. If you remember 2006, we did a tax cut of 50 cents. Yeah. Well, you, that was the year you also did the franchise swap out. Right. How'd that work out? Well, the taxpayer for a small, short period of time actually had a 50 cent tax cut. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we did that without putting any kind of restraints on filling in that bucket again once we poured it out. So you are prepared to say that you think that the legislature of this session will, quote, cut property taxes? I think, we'll, well, like I said, what we're working on right now, there's two different versions in the bill that Chairman Huey and I are working on. One of them is a, an initial cut. The other one is also trying to re- restrain the growth in the uh, recapture curve. Right. So we will see significant property tax savings for right. taxpayers, whether it's ongoing or if it starts off here right. a little lower. Now, when we talk about property tax reform in this session, we're talking about SB2 and HB2, the Benton Court and Burroughs joint effort to cap the rollback rate at 2.5%, automatic election and all that. Well, and what, the school what, finance bill also has it in there as well. There's right. a little connection between them. What do you two. think about that bill? Uh, you know, I've was involved with those discussions last session between six and four. Right. Uh, Bettencourt likes to say House wanted six, Senate wanted four. We compromised at 2.5. Well, somebody else did, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, I think... Was, was it somebody else, the governor? Well, I think we all know who it was. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Well, how come you don't... What is like Voldemort? Say his name. What is no, you know? I'm not afraid to say it. The governor did come up with a plan. He's really concerned right. about property tax. If you, and you talk about hearing from, from voters, the voters. Right. 
property taxes are off the charts. Mr. Chairman, unless I'm, unless I'm misreading your affect here, you don't seem very enthusiastic about this. No, I, I don't, don't get me wrong, it's just early. I didn't get much sleep. Um, <laughs> we will have some property tax reductions, I think, across the board. Will 2.5% be the rollback rate? I don't know where the, I don't know where the number is going to be. You know, once again, this is a legislative process. People put out ideas, and then we go through the legislative process and work through what, what kind of numbers we can deal Are with. Are you personally for it, Mr. Chairman? I can defend a lowered rate than what we have now. Based Which is on, 8%. Based on the history. But can you defend a 2 point? I mean, I keep asking you to just say yes or no. Would you defend a 2.5% rate? We'll go through that process and sort it out. Oh, man. <laughs> you understand that by not saying yes, you've said no. No, I didn't say no. Well, but Mr. Chairman, if you were enthusiastic about the 2.5% and I asked you if you were going to support it, you would say yes. I'm not sure if we can get 2.5% across the line. There's a That's whole lot of question. other people involved with this discussion. It's not just my opinion. Right. We've got 150 House members and 31 senators, and they all have different interests. They all have different people back home they're talking to. Are you to. hearing from mayors and council members of and course. county commissioners? Of course. Are, are they concerned? I mean, they marched up the street with pitchforks and torches last session complaining about having their ability to raise revenue restrained. I expect they're going to be back. I've heard from a number of them. It is a concern, but I will take you back to the history of the rollback. Right. You know, this first came out, I believe, in 1973. Right. And I think it was set at 5%. Gaylord, were you it, here? It, no, that's correct. And, and then part of the problem was the inflation. Well, so what happened, and right. we've actually got the, the testimony of Senator Faraby on the floor. Yeah. At that time, we had double-digit rates of inflation, and he said we should raise it to 8 and if inflation goes back down, we should lower it back down. Well, inflation two went years back later, down. Yeah. Two years later, it went down, and we've never lowered, never lowered it from 8%. Percent. And frankly, in some years, inflation right. was zero. And for most of that time, it's been about 2 2.5%. Two well, most people, I don't want to say everybody, but most people in the legislature, Democrats and Republicans, would stipulate that 8% is a number that probably can afford to come down. Yeah. I don't think the question is whether people think it should come down. There are the votes for it to come down. The question is, are there the votes to make it? 2.5%. And I don't know our, that. our Cassie Pollock and Emma Platoff of the Tribune reported in the last couple of days that from what they are able to tell from talking to members of the legislature that the votes may very well not be there. Well, I could just tell you from my perspective, I've had my head down working on school finance right. and school safety. That's been pretty much all consuming for me. So like when you talk about right. uh, Chairman Guerin's, I don't know what's been filed in the House. I know what Senator Huber, uh, Chairman Huber and I have been working on. And that's we spent a lot of time right. on this. Let's come back to the question of teacher pay, because that has been the defining feature of the, of the Senate's initial foray uh, into this. Again, I want to be sure that I understand this exactly, because I think I understand it, but maybe I'm not reading it properly. You are proposing, or it is being proposed as part of the not Senate my base, it is being proposed that there be a $5,000 pay increase for every single teacher in the state of Texas full working full-time, correct? Mm-hmm. That's correct, okay. That's in the bill. Right. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I think we needed to have a teacher pay raise okay. across the board. And, it's I, a, and I think we will gov have Governor some. has said he believes it's an emergency. Yeah. We need to be dealing with it. I think we will have a across the board teacher pay raise. Right. For the uninitiated, and I consider myself one of those, why would you give teachers who are considered to be not high performing, low performing teachers? I mean, because schools have, look, there are good journalists and bad journalists. There are good senators and bad senators. There are good teachers and bad teachers. Well, oh, wait, wait, go teachers. back to that part about the senators again. Why? Well, <laughs> so my question is, if we believe in outcomes-based and if we believe in pay for performance, why would the initial foray of the Senate be something that seems counter to that? Because it's the talent pool. You look at young people coming out of college and they're looking at salaries and what their opportunities are in those different fields, they look at salaries. And frankly, combining a teacher pay raise with a merit pay proposal, young, spirited, smart people can go, wow, that's a career I, I can really enjoy and I'm gonna make a decent living and I can do it. Yeah. So it's about the talent pool. We, we need more good people coming into education. Our numbers right now for our homegrown teachers is very low. In fact, half of our teachers today come from alternative certified programs. Mm -hmm. They're not coming through traditional university college education prep course. So the ultimate goal here, Mr. Chairman, is to increase the average teacher pay statewide. The most important, Bump it up. most important person in the educational process is a teacher in the classroom. Right. Uh, there's been a little bit of, of disagreement about whether what I'm about to say is true. So again, help fact check me here. Is it the case that the state can mandate how much districts pay teachers or do districts determine the pay of teachers themselves? Can a, you engineer that at the state level? Now we have a minimum salary schedule and the, and the districts pay beyond that. 
Right. So you can actually ultimately affect this. This is not essentially a funded mandate where you say to the districts, we're giving you this money, you have to use it for teacher pay increases, and they have no choice but to do it. They actually do have some choice in the matter. That, that's the details of the bill, but my understanding is that's what they're trying to make sure that it does, that this money does not go in the system and get diluted yeah. into other places. I mean, if you look at what's going on with education funding so far, if you look at teacher pay over the last 10, 20 years, it's done this, where a lot of other pay has done this within education. So yeah. this, there will be tight wraps around this to make sure we do a teacher pay raise. It's going to teachers. Right. Do you believe in local control as a principle? I know I, that's a loaded question in this legislature and no. the last and the last. But do you believe in local control? I believe in local control as long as they're doing a good job. So it's only lo it's, local control is only good if you agree with what they do? No. Uh, we have constitutional requirements. You know, we talk about local control in a lot of the city type things. When, when a city goes outside the Constitution, I think the state has a role to step right. in and say, no, you got to stay within the constitutional bounds. On, in this case, we're, we're partners with local ISDs yep. in education. We spend a lot of money in ISDs. And we do have just some requirements that they, you know, reach attainment levels for those students so, because so, yeah. every student in Texas is important. So if a school district were to come to you under the heading of local control, just a hypothetical, say the allocation to our school district to increase teacher pay per the Senate's proposal is a million dollars. And this school district comes to you and says, Mr. Chairman, we so much appreciate the state giving us this additional million dollars, but we are the ones on the ground in the district, in the schools. We have a better use for this money then giving a mandatory $5,000 pay increase to every teacher that we think would ultimately improve the quality of education and the attainment levels and everything else. We would like to have that money, but without the strings attached, in essence, of the states mandating that this be what it's used for. Tell me what you would say back to that district. On my understanding, the, will, the bill, the way it's drafted, is going to be very tightly crafted that it's going to teachers. Sorry, that's so that would sorry, be, sorry you have no choice. So that would be a discussion that would say, no, this is going for teacher pay. So in that respect, the decision by the district that they know better what would serve their students and their community would actually not be something that we could permit I, them to My understanding, the way that there. bill is crafted, it would not be a negotiable and you item. And you agree with that? And if you're going to give a teacher pay raise from the state level, yeah. this should go to teachers. Um, we pay for a lot of other stuff in education. We're making a lot of changes in how we fund education. You're making a stand in this case that this is important. Yeah, but we right. give them a lot of flexibility. We give them money based on these different criteria, but we don't require them to use it for that. Okay. You know, with transportation dollars, compensatory education. We give a lot of money to schools, and they have a lot of flexibility on how to spend that money. Yeah. But on the teacher pay issue, frankly, what we've seen statewide is this teacher's pay is not kept up with a lot of other people within education. Right. Well, we can all agree that teachers should be paid more and that this is important. I'm just trying to understand the politics well, of this. Well, that's a priority of the state. If we're going to do that, right. that, that goes But to as of right point. now, this is not where the House is, right? The House is not yet weighed in on this particular issue. That, that is a difference between the House and the Senate. Sure. That's something that's resolvable, you believe? Uh, it's all part of the legislative process. We'll have to see what happens. We'll get at the end of right. the day and we'll work all through all these things. One of the things, Mr. Chairman, that the School Finance Commission calls out is outcomes-based funding. Mm-hmm. Clearly, that is the root. You know, I, I expect that, that somewhere uh, Chairman Branch's ears are ringing up in uh, Dallas and any number of members of the legislature previously, whether it was on public ed or higher ed, have been talking about outcomes-based mm -hmm. funding yeah. forever and ever. All of a sudden now, the mountain has moved, and now that's the accepted wisdom. We're going to do outcomes-based funding. Is that the strategy now that we can assume is going to happen for all time? Well, just, just so you know, that's not all we're doing. No, I know, but I want, I want to focus yeah. on this part specifically. Okay, but we're yeah. doing outcomes-based frankly, for third grade reading, to have kids reading at the third grade level yep. in third grade. Right. And why is that important? Because up to third grade, kids are learning to read. From the third grade on, they're reading to learn. So if these kids can't read at the third grade level, their educational outcome from that point forward is heavily hindered. So early childhood that. education is for Early childhood education. So we're putting money into... Pre-third grade matters. It's not just third grade, it's, it's pre-K, it's first, second grade. You sound like one of those uh, godless socialist pre-K lovers. <laughs> you, I mean, I mean I'm, I, I'm sitting across from you. It's like, you know, I, uh, so you're, you are fully endorsing and embracing pre-K. It's not mandatory right. if you're talking about the godless uh, socialist. Socialists, okay. right, yeah. Uh, you know, Jonathan Stickler says we're ripping kids out of the arms of their parents no, in pre-K. Right? No, it's we're designed not doing that. for the low income particularly right. that, that demographic that we're struggling with yeah. educationally. And we're giving them the opportunity to go to pre-K with quality pre-K 
which is teachers that are trained to get these kids up to speed. So when they show up for first grade, they actually know their letters, they know their numbers, maybe even reading before they get there, like most of the other kids that, that we went to school with. You generally were reading before you got to first full grade. Full day? It's full day. So you are, endor you are endorsing you full day pre-K? Yes. Fully funded? Yes, it's in the, it's in the school finance. Fully program. funded, full day pre-K, just to be sure that I'm not misunderstanding. For, special, for our, for our low-income population. For only lower income. Yeah, but we're also including things like letting teachers' kids go for free into that program. Right. Is there going to be pushback, Mr. Chairman, in the Senate or out of the governor's office or any place else to embrace final? Because I'm going to characterize it as finally, because this to me seems like a change from where we've been before. Are you going to call it godless socialism? I won't call it godless. It has been called, as you know, godless socialism. But are, are you endorsing? I mean, is, is this is this endorsement of full, full day, fully this, funded pre-K going to be well received elsewhere in the Senate and in the center office? I'm just saying it was a consensus recommendation. And you're going and you're going with finance it. commission. Okay. Ba back to outcomes based funding. What outcomes? The other outcome is college, career, and military ready. So no, but I, I guess what I'm asking is, what are the outcomes that you're going to be basing the funding on? So you're saying one funding out. Oh, third grade reading. Third grade reading. You get more. For every kid that gets the third grade reading level, okay, and you get even more for the lower income kid that gets the, the okay. third grade reading. To really, and we're actually giving them more money to get there, right? And then we're going to pay on bonuses to do what we gave. So them that's money a metric. Get. Yes. What's another metric that you'll be funding based on? College, career, military ready. College, career, and military readiness. So you're so, going to use a benchmark where we are, and then you're going to see the kids graduate. Right. What are they doing after they graduate? Are they going on to community college? Are they going to university, getting a certification? Are they going to the military? You know, and saying the military is not a slam dunk. Today, 70% of our students do not qualify for the military. Yeah. So you want to see an improvement in, in those particular verticals, and then yes. that would be, okay, what else? Th that's the two that I think we have on the outcome right. uh, base. Um, so the anxiety in some circles that high-stakes testing is going to make a, a, a John Snow-like heralded return to the conversation here, and that all of a sudden uh, out, uh, that high-stakes testing is going to be back as part of the metric for funding... The speaker has said he's not for that. Are you for that? No. If you look at it, even the STAR, our accountability system, 40% of it's based on the STAR. All these other uh, metrics we just talked about are nothing, have nothing to do with STAR. Right. So there will be no this funding. This is what they do beyond. Right. What do they do on SAT, ACT? Right. Do they qualify? This is, this is out. This is what we want. You know, we're spending over $11,000 per student in Texas. Over 12 years, that's $130,000. I think our kids should be able to do these things once they graduate. A high school diploma should mean something. Right. And we need all these kids to have those opportunities. What we know today is that 65% of the jobs require some kind of post-secondary. You know about the 60-30 goal, right? Indeed. 6% of our population, 25 to 34 by the year by 2030. 2030, has something beyond high school. Some kind of completion. 60%. That seems kind of low to me until you find out where we are right now. Where are we at? About 30. We started at 36, 37. Now we're at 41 percent. Yeah. So this is something that has to be done. When I talk about transformative, we have to get right. there, or we will not be the Texas in the future, the very right. near future that we are today. So stipulated, but let me just be sure that I understood this for the purpose of those who are listening and looking for cues from you on where this is headed. High stakes testing will not be a metric associated with funding as part of this school finance redo. No. It. it well, it's in our, in our assessment system, our A through F. Yeah. Uh, but the, all the goals, the third grade and that, yeah. maybe the third grade reading is how they measure the, the third grade uh, being at that third grade level. You have confidence in the STAR test, Mr. Chairman? I do have pretty good confidence in that test. Have you read Texas Monthly story I did. posted yesterday? The, uh, social media is just off its moorings about yeah. this Mimi Schwartz about eight story about the, star, about the STAR test. I was at an event. I got about eight texts while right. I was sitting at the event. So what... what possibly gives you confidence in the STAR test at the conclusion of reading that story? Well, it was put together by Texas teachers. They helped put together the questions. Uh, so we have Texas teachers' involvement in the process. Uh, I but, think there, there were some hits on, the, on our commissioner. Um, well, our, I guess the big problem as far as the story is alleging, I mean, among other things, is that there are questions designed several reading levels above those taking the test, and so the tar this. I'm going to, my words, not their words, that the star is setting up students to fail. Do you really think we would, I mean, I didn't design it, but do you really think anybody here would design a program 
first. Not, not intentionally, but the allegation is that somehow if you're going to do assessment, no. do assessment in a way that's properly targeted to the students taking the test. Yeah. That's the assessment. That's no, the, the, the allegation. allegation was that it's done that way to make our public schools look bad. And I don't know of anybody who would do that intentionally. You know, we have 5.4 million students. What happens with these students really means something. Yep. And I don't think, you know, we, there's a lot of other metrics we can use. They, they try to diss the STAR test, but there are other metrics out there that we have available to look at. Yep. NAEP, National Association of Educational Progress, a national nationwide standardized yes. test. You know where we rank on reading? Better, 45th be, yeah, in yeah. third grade. Right. 41st in eighth grade. Yeah. Can I you, don't think the do people better. of Texas are going to be very happy to have our kids just get that yeah. level of educational attainment. All right, so the STAR test, as far as you're concerned, is working well enough, you're cool with the STAR test. I'll be happy to have a discussion about it, but I'm not getting dissuaded from what we're working on yes, sir. on school finance. You, you just said, uh, talked about higher ed has a 60 by 30 strategy. It does. And yeah. whether anybody believes that that goal is attainable, it's at least something to shoot for. I right? think it is attainable. Right. Why is there not a 60 by 30 type plan for public ed? Well, shouldn't, there, shouldn't there be a moonshot for public ed in a similar vein, an equivalent to it? where you put out a marker and say, by this date, we expect X, and we're going to do everything we can to direct time, energy, and financial and human resources toward that goal? I think that's part of the School Finance Commission. I'd have to go back and check, but I think there is something about putting that metric out there. So but there may ultimately be a grand plan on the order of 60 by 30 for public yeah. ed. But I hope it's a lot higher than 60. Once again, if you're spending $130,000 for a child's education, I don't think people are going to be happy to work 6% of the so time. So you don't think if, so if, the, if higher ed institutionally gets to 60% by 2030 per the plan, you don't think that's ambitious enough. You don't think that's success. Well, once we get there, we need to raise it higher than that. So I maybe, think it's maybe success from where we are by now. 40 or something like that. You need attainable goals, but as you, once you get to 60, we ought to go to 70. Once yeah. you get to 70, you ought to go to 80. Chairman, are there commission recommendations that you think will have a hard time getting through the Senate or getting through the legislature? Oh, you know, there were like 35 recommendations. I think there's already a couple that we're having issues with as we're putting the bill together and getting numbers together. Uh, but Brian Give me, Large, an, exa give me an example of something that you may have a hard time with. I, I couldn't give you one off the top of my head. But n not, nothing big. None no, of the big, no, the pieces big stuff is in is there. viewed controversially yeah. inside the building. Yeah. And so you're confident enough as far as it goes. That and some of those issues may or may not still be in there. They're, they're being debated as we speak, working on how that works. Okay. Um, on retire, let me ask you about three issues sort of kind of divorced from the commission report, but more in the realm of the Public Education Committee, if you don't mind. Um, what should we do about retired teachers? I alluded earlier to the possibility of taking money out of the allocation, uh, the rainy day fund, and directing it to the retired teacher problem. But do you have a, a, a theory as the chair of the committee for several sessions running about the nature of the problem and the nature of a potential solution, regardless of the question of how to fund it? Are you talking about the, the pension or the health care? I'm talking about both. Okay. Well, the issue we're having on the health care side is teachers retiring prior to Medicare eligible. Right. That's a big cost driver in that. We have, you have teachers retiring at earlier ages, and they're, that's actually the most expensive ages to be on health insurance. Right. So there's a, a, a gap yeah. or a gulf, right. Uh, so there's some ideas on, on even how you do that. Even for the Medicare eligible, do we quit offering TRS care and give them the money, let them go get a Medicare plan on their own, you know, some of those plans don't have a premium at all. So that's under discussion. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, the, these are just some of the ideas that are out there. On the, and this on the will care be side. business in your committee. Uh, no, that we have a separate committee. You know, Joan Huffman, Senator Huffman, has been carrying the uh, that bill last session, and she's worked on it again this session. What about the pe the pension piece? Will be that discussed all goes by, through Senator Huffman. All through Senator Huffman. So what, what what's your sense of that issue as well? Well, there's obviously, great interest in it and getting it fixed, and I think we have some ideas that'll get us down the road much further. You know, the the um, Having it where it's, I'm, I'm slipping on the term for, um, that's an insurance term, I should know this. Help me. Actuarial. Actuarially sound, thank you very much. Gosh, it, it is early. Uh, it, the problem is, you know, the, the longer we don't do something with it, the worse it gets. And frankly, right. if this is a problem that was handed off to us. There's a cost of doing nothing. Yeah. yeah. And so we tried to do a little bit last time, we got pushed back. We really should have done more last time because now the bills Right back where it was last time. So again, the one-time allocation from the Brain Day Fund would not ultimately solve the problem over, change, the, over the long term. You have to make some kind of systemic right. change on that. Uh, we talked a little bit about school safety earlier or alluded to it. That was one of the governor's emergency items. And I'm sorry, what was that? School safety. Oh, yeah. We talked about school safety. Um, the legislature, it, it seems clear, is going to act on that. 
is the, is, is the retrofitting of schools and the mental health professionals added to uh, schools and school districts enough as no, far as you see? No, it's a multi-passer thing. There's a number of things we have out there. Uh, you know, Texas Tech has their health deal that they could do telemedicine-wise. and We might expand that to other health-related institutions across the state. Uh, there's fusion centers that actually monitor social media because almost all these people have done these violent things, have posted things online. That if, right. you, if anybody was watching, you'd go, what, what in the world? So these fusion centers kind of monitor that. Uh, there's a number already in the state uh, you know, expanding that. So there's a number of things like that to help get the whole picture. Right. The, the best thing you can do on the, this issue, school safety, is prevention. Right. And so the mental health intervention counseling and having our teachers train, and that's part of what the Texas Tech system does, Twitter, it's a different Twitter, but it, it helps uh, identify, they, they train teachers on things to look for. And then they ask teachers to identify them by this, you know, that has two or three of these characteristics, and then they just kind of connect them with people who can talk to them on the phone, have a couple sessions, and then that person can, can decide whether or not they need further right. discussion, if that's enough to get them back on the path. What we've learned is these kids, if they get a little off the path, if you get to them early enough, you get them back on the path and everything's fine. But it's when they get off the path, they just go off into a spiral on their own where we yeah. end up with these terrible acts, whether it's suicide or homicidal or just causing other people injury. So we need to get a better handle early on. And we're not screening every student, but having teachers trained to look for certain characteristics and then be referring those, yeah. those particular students. Mr. Chairman, I know the politics of this state. I know how conservative this state is. I know that this is a state where the Second Amendment is valued. There are parents, surely, in your district, and you, you, you're a parent. I mean, you know, have had kids in this situation. There are school districts, superintendents, teachers in your community who would say, if you're talking about preventive, why are we not having a conversation about guns? Since the gun is often the weapon of choice for some of these folks who, whatever their mental health challenges may be, perpetrate these crimes. There are people who believe we should be having a conversation, even in a conservative state like Texas. Well, two things. One... Uh, Santa Fe, for, for example, which happened in my district, it was with a shotgun. Yeah. And frankly, the devastating effect of a shotgun. But it's a 17-year-old kid. There's a shotgun in his house. Um, I don't think any of the gun laws anybody's talked about would, would have affected that. Secondly, if someone's intent on doing harm to other people, there are many ways of doing it. This particular student had little, what they call crickets. They were IEDs. They didn't work, but he had them. Yep. Uh, frankly, you can, I hate to say it, but you could run over kids standing and waiting for the school bus. If you really want to do harm, there's multiple ways of doing that. The best thing we could do is try to find those kids that are having those problems who need someone to reach out to them and bring them back in. Uh, you, you can't, this is not, there's not a one size fits all and there's not going to be a perfect world. If there's someone intent on doing harm to other people, there are multiple ways of doing it. Yep. And it's not always with a gun. So initially, when the governor convened his working groups on this issue following the Santa Fe uh, uh, situation, he said we ought to have a conversation about red flag laws. He mm -hmm. did not come out for red flag laws, but he said we ought to have a conversation about red flag laws. And he got enormous pushback from, among others, your presiding officer. And ultimately, that conversation went away. Should we be having a conversation about red flag laws, in your opinion, associated with the school safety issue, Mr. Chairman? Not really. No. You, you don't think we should? Do no. you think that's too much of an imposition on the rights of gun owners? Yeah, I'm, I'm all for, you know, make sure we have people that, for example, carry, have their background checked, that type of thing. I, I'm, I'm fully supportive of that, and I've, I've had a CHL since they had one. Yes, sir. Um, but just the idea you're going to, you know, arbitrarily do something, I can't support that. Okay. Um, last session, when I interviewed Chairman Huberty at about this time in the session, I asked him about vouchers, school choice, somewhere along that continuum. I mean, I know we talk about school choice as if it's one thing. School choice is many things, depending upon who you talk to. But what I meant, what we talked about, was some sort of a modified voucher program. And he said, don't even send me the bill. It's dead on arrival if it shows up in my committee. And indeed, the House was no more interested in that topic than it had been in the previous two sessions. It appears that momentum on that issue has slowed from the previous sessions to this one. In fact, we're not hearing much discussion of that this session. There's some, but not much. Would you tell us whether this is gonna pop back up as an issue in the Senate? Because it's been the Senate that's driven yeah. this conversation in the well, past. Well, I'll just tell you, I, I, I do believe that children should have a choice, particularly those who can't afford. We have choice, as you said, already. Yeah. Typically, the wealthy people, 
that can exercise a choice, pick where they want to move, or they move wherever right. they want, and they send the kid to private school. But we have a lot of kids who are, who are in struggling schools and yeah. have been for many years. I'm a believer in that, but right now my focus is on 5.4 million public school students. We have got to get the school right. finance system fixed. Right. I know what you believe, I, and I know that you probably don't disbelieve what you've believed in the past is what you just said. That, that's your position on the issue. I'm saying as a political tactician, as a vote counter, and as the chairman of the committee, can you read the room and say, yeah, that's not gonna come back up this session. We're not gonna talk about that. I have to pass school finance committee. That's where your focus is. This is landmark. Right. This is monumental. So you have no plans for that legislation to come before no. your committee? You do not, okay, very well. Is there anything we haven't talked about today that we ought to be thinking about on public education that maybe is not on our radar screen, but is on yours? Gosh, it's too early in the morning to bring up a blank question like that. Uh, that's my job. We're just doing a lot of things. You know, you yeah. talk about the STAR test. Yeah. I would just say I, my goal is to make the STAR test better. And frankly, I think our commissioner's already done some improvements. The fact that we now have a report card yep. for kids, you know, this whole mystery of what's on the STAR test, parents can now see the questions that their child missed. So we're taking a lot of the mystery out of it, and it's yep. actually showing where they are compared to other students. Yep. So it's actually beneficial too. But the other thing is that I still have a problem with is the STAR test takes too long. Uh, you know, you're having young kids sitting down for a couple hours. That's not necessarily a measure of what they know. It's a measure of their endurance. Right. And I'd like to see that shortened. And now we have, we, we, we did broadband, right. a bill last session to get all schools on broadband. Now we have broadband. I'd like to get the STAR test done in a smaller version online, do it at the beginning of the year, and do it at the end of the year. Small, small real quick. Yeah. Takes out the security issues because the computer can randomize the questions. You don't have to shut down the whole campus. Of course, you have to hope that the technology works. Well, there, there's that. But that's true of anything. Oh, but if, the you run, fact well, is, what, if you run a website, it's no different. But the uh, fact yeah. is, Agreed. you do that beginning and end, you can actually see how that child did during that year. Yep. You know, how much measurable progress was there that year. Frank, right. And the other side of that is, right now we do the STAR test in April. When they get the results back in the summer, well, if the kid didn't get it, you've missed a whole year of education. How inefficient is that? Where if you do it at the beginning right. of the year, you may find out some kids already have it. They can go do something else right. at a higher level. V very, very, qu very quickly, where to go after the very kids quickly you say you're worried about how much time the test takes to take. Do you worry about how much time the test takes to prepare for it? That is often a pushback among parents and some That's school professionals that the preparation for the test during the year ultimately overwhelms the, 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 the simple diffusion of knowledge. That's a local issue. We have a lot of school districts taking practice tests and those types of things. That's, that's a local issue. We don't pre prescribe practice tests. You think it's a that. legitimate concern, though? I, I think it can be, yeah. yeah. When I hear about the practice tests and all that, you add all those up, it does become quite a number of tests. But, you know, you have to remember we went from 17 to graduate high school to five. Five. So we've, we've, done, we've done a good job of reducing that. Five is a good number? Yeah, you know, I frankly, one of my ideas would be the, the citizenship test is in lieu of the, uh, the social uh, studies exam, but I get pushed back from social studies teachers. So, you know, and then we have the TEKS, you know, the State Board of Education elected body puts together these TEKS, and they want to make sure we're, right. you know, we're covering those TEKS. So there's, you know, there's pushback. Once again, it's not always my opinion. I get to do whatever I want. Okay. Um, in fact, let's, I never get to do it, even at home. <laughs> let's take a couple questions while we have the time to do that. Please put your hands up. We'll be happy to... Mr. Gray, and then woman in the front, and then gentleman in the back. Right there. I understand that school finance has always been about equal funding for children. There have been uh, allowances made for students that are economically disadvantaged or have other issues. However, the funding scheme that removes money from districts to add to other districts does not take into consideration right now that the cost in a high property tax value district flows down into the cost of providing an education. So you have situations where you have teachers where you're mandating essentially or, or setting standards for teacher pay across the state. Those teachers in those high property tax dis districts are paying more rent, they're paying more for properties, and a lot of those teachers can't even live in their district. So will you take that into consideration in your funding? Well, I'll, I'll address the, I think the first part of your question had to do with the, uh, the recapture, particularly for, for districts that are high wealth, but the, the individual students are not high wealth. We are making sure that recapture under the school finance commission report bill that we're working on right now, that whatever you're entitled to 
that you get that, never less than that. So recapture will never take you, like if you look at your bucket, right now some people's buckets actually get reduced, but they don't even have a full bucket at the end after recapture. We're gonna make sure that those districts have their bucket full, and so the recapture will be reduced by that amount to make sure we take care of and take into account uh, you know, the demographics that we're trying to address. As far as local issues, as far as the uh, teacher pay and that type of thing. And, and the cost of living in those communities. Yeah. Now, we, we've had a cost of education index since this actually was put out in the, based on data from the late 80s, and it's never been Never updated. been updated, right? Well, there's some discussion of getting rid of the cost of education index. That's one of the, the, commi the school commission, commission recommendations was right to now. get rid of the CI because if we're not going to update it, you might as well get rid of it and put the money in, like, basic allotment, right. which helps all the districts, which is kind of the direction we're on right now is to, re to eliminate that. Uh, uh, correct, but we're also giving more money for basic a lot, which helps on that and on the recapture. The and so, how do, you, how do you equalize a district that is paying out tremendous amounts of money to the state, but yet it is being penalized because uh, due to its higher property value, those teachers uh, should be compensated more for having to live in well, high cost areas? Quick if, answer, we'll go to the next. If I could. What I want people to do on the school finance bill that we're putting out, rather than looking at individual pieces of it, I think people need to look at the whole package. Because there's a lot of pieces going into here, and we're gonna have people, we've already heard somebody talking about the CIA is going away, and what that's gonna do. They don't know the whole picture. So I think we all need to wait. Step back from Step the, back, yeah. look at the whole package. Right. And here's what's gonna happen. This is the politics of it. We're gonna have this whole package, and it doesn't matter what we do, there are gonna be some districts who are gonna be harmed. Now, in the past, we've had things called hold harmless. Right. Well, we've held hold harmless that are still in the form today from 1993. But we're not going to do hold harmless. We're going to do transitions. So to help soften it, we're going to have this package, and there's still going to be some sharp edges. We're going to use some money to round, round off some of those, smooth off those hard edges so we can politically pass the bill because yeah. that's what you have to do. But, but look at the package. Don't, don't get caught don't up on one part of it. the individual part. Ma'am. Thank you. Yes, Senator, you mentioned um, school safety and the uh, Santa Fe that the, the student, it was the parent's gun and had access to it. Um, what are your plans? I know Representative Howard filed a bill on public safety education, uh, safe storage, uh, supporting something like that and including something of safe storage messaging for the state so that parents are accountable that they properly store their guns so that their children that are at risk okay. don't have access to them. If, if this has been an eight-year-old that showed up with a gun, I think that would be a valid point. We're talking about a 17-year-old, and it's a shotgun. So this, I mean, I don't know the story, but this kid could have gone hunting with his dad. I don't know what the story was, but most 17-year-olds, you can't lock stuff up in the house and keep it from them. Uh, these aren't eight, nine-year-olds. They have either been hunting, they know where the keys are. So it's a different, Santa Fe really was outside of what we'd seen before in so many other cases. Almost everything that happened in Santa Fe was not what we'd seen like at Parkland, you know, where the kid had numerous encounters with law, numerous encounters at the school. This kid didn't have that. In fact, I talked to students in his class who said there was eight or nine kids they'd have picked before him which kind of scared me. There were eight or nine other kids they thought might do might that. Might have done it, right. But they said this, I would have not ever picked this kid. So right. you see what I'm saying? I think they're a safe storage for younger kids, obviously, because we have kids getting shot at home all the time that find the gun and get out and shoot themselves yeah. or their playmate. So is it for or against the safe storage? What, one of the pushbacks, Chairman, is on sa safe storage has been that somehow it infringes upon the liberty of the people at home who own guns, that somehow you're telling people, mandating how they have to store their I, th firearms. I think we already have liability laws. You know, as a parent, if your child does something, uh, that there are, you know, there are some, uh, for certain ages, there are some criminal penalties for your child doing that's, things. And that's sufficient. As I a think check that's up. That's a check yeah. on that. Let me take one more in the back. Is that Mr. Martyr? How are you doing? Doing well. Sir. Statewide college readiness fell in 2016 from 55 to 35%. I don't think it's on the schools and the teachers, but it's going to create huge problems with 60 by 30 and impact all the attempts to hold schools accountable for college readiness. Got any plans to fix it? I'm not sure about your numbers dropping from 55 to 36. Yes, I can oh, show you. Uh, 
But you say it's not on the teachers and who? It's not on, his point is it's not on the schools or the teachers necessarily, but it creates a problem in two ways. One is it's going to require a lot of remediation for kids entering higher ed. But the second thing is if you're going to base funding decisions on that particular outcome of college readiness and college readiness is heading down, doesn't that create a problem for schools that are trying to deal with this issue and remain solvent? Well, well real quick, and I'll try to be quick. Here, here's our, We have challenges in Texas. Great state. But with our demographic changes, we have real challenges. If you, if you look at Texas education compared to the rest of the country based on and adjusted for our demographics, we're like number three in the nation. Unfortunately, if you take away those demographic adjustments, we're like 32nd. So that's my whole point about this transformative school finance system. We have to address our needs because these kids don't get to go out and uh, compete with a handicap. You know, they don't get, oh, you get, so you get the job no matter what. No. They're having to compete head to head, so we can't use that as an excuse. We've got to overcome those challenges. And I'm t here's my challenge. As, as Texans, frankly, this is in our DNA. We meet challenges. We've, we've won our independence from another country. We've put man on the moon. Uh, we've survived things like Harvey and made an example of how people help people all over the country. Our best natural resource in Texas is that we're a state full of Texans, whether you were born here or you moved here. It's in our DNA, and we're going to do this. Our state leads the country in so many ways, there's no reason we can't lead in education with our demographics that we have, because it's a great blessing to have that diversity, but we have to get all those kids that opportunity to go out and compete head-to-head -head with our country, and frankly, not just our country, with the world. Okay. Let's end right there. Mr. Chairman, thank you for being here. Thank you to all of you. We'll see you again soon. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you.